Welcome back to The Shed. Tonight we take a look at The Doomsday Book by Connie Willis. When this novel came out, it won the Nebula and Hugo Awards in 92 and 93 respectively. It actually shared the Hugo Award with Vern Avenger's uh, A Fire Upon the Deep. So a highly acclaimed novel that was up, up against some pretty stiff competition. So this novel is the first in a series of novels that Connie wrote in this not too distant future where scientists or historians rather are researching time travel at Oxford University. So the Oxford Historian Time Travelling Tale Book. The others in the series include To Say Nothing of the Dog, which also won the Hugo Award. I think it was also the Nebula, but they're both highly acclaimed novels. To Say Nothing of the Dog um, and also Blackout and All Clear, which are, are two volume novels that were released in the same year. So I'll be reviewing those three novels on this channel as well in the not too distant future. So the novel follows this young lady called Kieran Engel. And she's a research historian at Oxford University and she wants to take a trip back to the 14th century. And her mentor, a guy called Mr. Dunworthy, has got some reservations. So he's almost treating her like his own child and he's concerned about her going back into the 14th century just before the plague broke out in Europe uh, because he's worried about all the consequences and, and obviously the 14th century, the 1300s, were a pretty difficult time in our history. So Dunworthy can't talk Kiveran, young Kiveran Engel out of going back into time to investigate this particular time period because he's been assured by, um, by the research assistants that the time travelling has, uh, and this is a rather interesting point in the book, that the time travelling prohibits the history itself somehow prohibits people going back into time at certain periods in time where that could actually uh, alter historical events. So there's some kind of built-in mechanism into not so much the technology that they use, but history itself that prohibits these people going back into a period of time where that can cause, um, obviously, a ripple effect, a butterfly effect, right? So there are some built-in controls, and they talk about this thing called slippage, which basically means that you know, there could be, you, you have a, a specific point in time where you're going to be going back into history, back in time on, and there's a talk of slippage, and that slippage could be five minutes up to five years maximum. Um, so, you know, she, they put her into this period where she's well buffered and shouldn't be in any real concern when it comes to the horrific events that happened during Europe, uh, during the bubonic plague or the Black Death. Um, but what happens during the novel is that we have this young Kieran, she's about to embark, and this distant future, not too distant future, I think it was 2045 if memory holds me correct. I've only just finished the novel, but I'm not sure if you're like me, I never pay attention to dates. <laughs> I know it's in the distant future, and I think it was something like 2045 that the world uh, sort of takes place here. And this, so what we find is that this young engineer called Bajri, he's plugging in all the figures to get it to her coordinates. Um, and he happens to run back into the room where Dunworthy is just shortly after Kieran has made the jump into history, all nervous, all upset, saying something's gone terribly wrong. Something's gone terribly wrong. So the novel is written in that back and forth between the two parts, between 2045, future England, Oxford University, to young Kieran going back in time into the 1300s, the 14th century. And we're not quite sure exactly where she landed. That's because this Bajri guy, like I said, is running saying, hey, something's gone terribly wrong. And he basically fell to fever and he wasn't able to communicate exactly what he was talking about. And what we find is that young Kieran has Got, has gotten sick. So she's uh, finding herself just come out of a jump point um, and she's really, really fatigued and she's thinking, oh, this is not what I was expecting. No one really told me that this was one of the, the um, repercussions of time travel or the symptoms of the time jumps. So she's all confused and starting to feel like, no, there's something really not quite right here. But She's picked up by some of the local villagers. So she, she's found by this guy called Gowan uh, and Father Roach, who's a priest in the village. And they've sort of taken care of her, taken her back to the village and really tried to make her recover. Um, and she's in a really bad state, mind you. And this Father Roach guy, he is a very tall man, very scary looking guy. 
she thinks that she's been taken on by bandits and this cutthroat is actually grabbed hold of her and going to do some pretty nasty things. So in her delirium and her sickness, she's lashing out and all these things happen, right? She eventually recovers from her illness and she starts to realize, hang on, has there been some slippage? Where am I exactly? She's trying to rationalize as to where she's at exactly at what point in time. And we find that, you know, life in the 1300s was a really, really tough time in Europe. And she befriends the villagers. She actually becomes the nanny for these young, two young uh, girls in Agnes and Rosemond, two wonderful little children who have got pretty cool characters themselves. And she's basically caretaking them. And she's feigned amnesia because the story that she came into you know, she, she sort of made a, a story, a backstory as to how she came to be on the road and why she was alone. But she quickly discovered that, hey, that backstory is not going to really cut it. I'm going to have to wing this and I'm just going to feign amnesia and that may buy me some time to get back to my drop point to be able to return back to my time. And what we find is that there's a set of circumstances that occur and that's where I'm going to stop it because uh, I think it's saying any more than that is a bit of a spoiler. So, what a wonderful, absolutely wonderful novel the Doomsday Book is. In my last review, I talked about how important it is for characters to grab your attention, to for you to be invested in the characters. I'm referring to the fourth season. Oh, sorry, the fifth season when I uh, reviewed it a couple of weeks back on this channel, and I made a criticism of. You know, I was 40% you know, through the book and I was just not invested in those characters. And I would like to talk to some of those things in this book and, and some of the contrasts as to why I think it's so important for my reading pleasure, and you may be the same, why character development is such an important piece of work when it comes to these science fiction novels, for me at least. So what I really liked, wonderful characters. I love Dunworthy. I thought he was a real cool father figure of a lecturer, a professor. I really liked Gilchrist as well, Professor Gilchrist, because he was a he played really well against Dunworthy, right? That sort of had that jousting sort of relationship in the novel that I really enjoyed. Young Kieran is just a young girl. She's a scientist, and I think she's just a wonderful hero in the novel as well. And she demonstrates to be a wonderful hero in the story as well. Back, back in history, we have Father Roach. And what a wonderful, beautiful person Father Roach was. I mean, you would just hope that people like that were around in the 1300s when life was so tough. Just to give them that peace that Father Roach happened to be able to give people in this particular novel. So we had wonderful people like Father Roach. We had Lady Edermine, I think her name was, uh, the mother-in-law of the particular household he fell into, who was this typical, ah, oh, you, you can never do anything right, Father Roach, you know? Very religious, dogmatic, and you have to light the candles in this particular way, and if you don't, then you're not the right kind of person. Um, not, and just completely disregarded the loving, wonderful nature that Father Roach had. And how much of himself is sacrificed for his little village, right? So I like the counterbalance between, you know, Father Roach, who was this loving person, just trying to be God's love on earth, to this lady who was just so religious and dogmatic in the sense that it doesn't really matter if you love people and you care for people, as long as you follow all the religious rigor that you need to, right? So very different contrast. And, and that's what I really loved. It. Almost every character in here, had a contrasting character that I really enjoyed. And the characters were just characters that you fell in love with. You have young Agnes, who's this fiery young two-year-old, full of fire, you're full of fight. And you had Rosemond, her older daughter, 12-year-old, who's trying to teach her and trying to demonstrate that she's the older daughter. Right? Just enough of that. <laughs> Wonderful characters is what I'm really saying. Really enjoyed the characters in this novel. What I really enjoyed as well around the book is that I don't think, I, I don't know how much I would say this is a historical novel, right? And it's a, a real and true historical, factual account of what life was like in the 1300s. But I would say it's, it's, it's a good book to give you 
a feel for what life and the conditions were. I don't necessarily think it's the most well-researched novel. Um, there's certain aspects of it that I think, yeah, that's that sounds, at least for my amateur historical, I, I love that 1300s to 1400s, you know, the 14th century. I, I, it's sort of one of my favourite parts of history. Um, but I'm no definitely no historian, right? But I, I would say that it gives you a really good glimpse into what times were like back then. But I wouldn't necessarily say this is the most wonderful historical account I've ever read. Uh, but I did like the historical setting and I thought it was really wonderfully done as well. The other thing that I really enjoyed in the novel uh, is that it's just one of those novels that for me it was just a perfect winter novel. We're winter down under. We had a couple of pretty cool nights. And it's just the kind of book that you want to sit down and read. For the sake of reading, and I'll explain why that is so important when I get to some of the things that I think are not necessarily great in this novel. So some of the things that, um, it's not that I dislike, that I thought, yeah, a little lacking potentially, is when you get to, you know, I'd say from about a quarter of the way through the book to about almost three quarters of the way through the book, the plot doesn't really develop much. Now, I could call that a negative. But I'm actually not going to say that when it comes to this particular novel. Although I, I did find myself, and I remember I was talking to my daughter, and we sort of um, exchange ideas when it comes to books. She loves, she reads as well. Not a science fiction reader, but we, we go for walks and we talk about, so what's happening in your book? And one of the things that she asked me one day, she goes, oh, so what's happening in your book? And I literally turned around and said, oh, nothing from what I told you yesterday. Girl's gone in the past, something's gone wrong and we're still trying to figure out exactly what's going on. Now, that could be a negative for some people. But what I found is that because it's so well written, because the characters are enjoyable, I actually didn't mind the plot not having to move. I, I found myself enjoying reading the book for the sake of reading it, knowing eventually that something's going to change, right? You knew that things were going to work together and there was going to be some kind of outcome. And for me, because it was such a wonderfully written novel, because you started to see and understand these the characters, because even though the plot is not progressing, the characters are. You're absorbing the way they live, you're absorbing what their fears are, what their anxieties are, and that all helps build the characters. So as much as I find myself thinking, well, the plot hasn't really moved in the last 100, 150 pages, um, I found myself enjoying it because it was just a book that you didn't mind reading knowing that things were going to come together which is in stark contrast to what i found myself with the fifth season i found the plot not going anywhere and the characters i just didn't care for for i you know explained that right it's for me the plot yeah a bit didn't really progress as quickly as i thought it probably could but I don't claim that to be a negative for this book because I think if she had done it any faster, the character development might not have quite have worked as well as I think it has for me. Some of the other things that I found a bit odd, you know, we have this technology that can go back in time, yet somehow we haven't put all the safety measures in to be able to locate individuals pinpoint when they go back in time so you know they we can put devices into our bodies that we can keep detailed records that will last six seven hundred years when dug out of the ground but somehow we still weren't able to precisely locate people when they were back in time so i find that a bit odd the other thing that i found a bit odd as well is i just found it a bit unplausible that you know historians dictate time travel and what happens i thought you know i just can't see in a not too distant future maybe if this was the year 3000 i might think differently about it but because it was like 2050 2045 or whatever it was i, I thought that's not you know the book was written in 1992 right so th that's what 30 40 years we're not talking a, you know hundreds of years where the technology would be used as a research tool in um in you know, universities, as opposed to being highly confidential and tightly managed by the military of certain countries, right? So I found that bit a bit, yeah, I don't know how believable this time travel tale is. 
but look, that's just a minor criticism. At the end of the day, it's fiction, right? It's science fiction. So I'll, I'll pardon that. It was not a, it, it didn't distract me from reading the novel, but I sort of did remember reading through the book thinking, yeah, that's, I don't know how much I believe this would just be monopolized by historians and somehow, you know, uh, military is not involved in any shape or form, given that it's only been, you know, 30, 40 years in our future. So when it comes to the memory test, this one has stood the test of time pretty well for me. Uh, I read it in about 2015, the first time I read it. And I do remember, yes, this is one of those Oxford historian time traveling books. But I may be a little bit biased in that because I did enjoy the book. I remember when I first read it, really thoroughly enjoying it, that I went and, uh, you know, bought the other books um, uh, like To Say Nothing of the Dog and All Out um, and Blackout and All Clear as well, right? So I am, that's why potentially it's stuck as far, as well as it has in my memory because of that I'll, you know, I've read a couple of books in this series. But when it comes to what I particularly remembered about this novel, I did remember Father Roach and I did remember Dunworthy as well. Again, Dunworthy, he reappears in some of the other books in this series, so take that one for a, a grain of salt. But the old Father Roach, I thought Father Roach is what religious, you know, Christian people should aspire to be. People were self-sacrificing, loving, and caring. I, I thought he was a wonderful person, Father H. Uh, so I did really remember him. So yeah, look, wonderful novel, the, uh, the Doomsday Book by Connie Willis. What a thoroughly enjoyable read. I really, really, really did enjoy this novel. It's going to be really interesting when we look at our sci-fi shed ladder and how we rank this one. But recommendations, I think if you read, you know, To Say Nothing of the Dog or All, all Out or Blackout and All Clear, where it's, I always forget the titles, Blackout and All Clear, if you read those novels and you haven't read the Doomsday Book, you won't be disappointed. It's very much in that vein, wonderful novel. Um, and also if you like, you know, time travel stories. I think if you like time travel stories or if you have an interest in history, I think you will also highly enjoy the Doomsday Book. Hey... Yeah, for me, it's 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 an awesome, wonderful book. I don't know how many times I've said wonderful in this particular release, but this is truly a gem for me. Uh, the only thing I can say is a negative. Yeah, some people may find it a bit slow in the middle there, but for me, it was just a perfect winter's novel. So maybe that's a recommendation too. When it comes to your winter, wherever you are in the world, you may just want to pick this one up and start reading it. Let's go to the Sci-Fi Shed later and see where we're going to rank tonight's great novel. Back to the shed ladder and yet another very difficult decision. I've been staring at this board for the last 20 minutes trying to figure out exactly where this novel is going to end up today and it's going to be a very difficult decision. So just as a quick recap, we've got June down to red shirts, ascending to descending from uh, left to right uh, and on the B side we've got flowers of for our genome down to the fifth season. So left to right ascending to descending order it's not going to be on the b side 100 percent. there's no doubt about that it's definitely an a side of this one and the chain and i've been asking myself this question where about does this actually sit because it's a wonderful novel it's one of those novels that makes you feel really good right for me at least i just really enjoyed it and part of me says you know what i think this is the most enjoyable book i've ever read and it should sit right above June but I'm going to go through my normal criteria and try to see is it truly as good as June and does it need to sit on top of that so let's go through the list eh? and I think we're going to start with the left hand of darkness because in some ways I really find Connie's writing gives me the same the same feelings when it comes to just how wonderful of a writer she is I, I found myself the same when I was reading Ursula Le Guin's novels um, and I think that Connie gives me that kind of same kind of feelings. But I'm going to say the Doomsday Book for me was a better novel than The Left Hand of Darkness. I enjoyed the storyline. I enjoyed the characters. Uh, and I really enjoyed the setting as well. I think it had strong science fiction themes as well. You could argue that really the only science fiction is this time travel machine that they don't really go into much um, detail on but for me I, I like time travel tales so for me I think it is better than the left hand of darkness I also think it's more enjoyable than the than the forever war I like the forever war because like I mentioned in the past I think it's got some really interesting themes and the novel itself 
is a little deeper than most people probably at face value would appreciate. But I think that the Doomsday Book overall was a much more enjoyable novel than The Forever War. Now, Case of Conscience, I really enjoyed as well. It was a wonderful novel. I really liked the characters in The Case of Conscience. I really enjoyed the themes. And I really remember walking away thinking, this is just a wonderful novel. And I really liked the idea and the concept they, they gave you around, you know, what if we did find some alien beings? How would it reconcile with your religious beliefs? So I really did enjoy the themes. But overall, again, overall, I enjoyed reading Doomsday Book more than I did A Case of Conscience. To Your Scattered Bodies Go, wonderful novel, really well written, really strong characters, those non-fictional characters, um, really great concept about that resurrection, really held the test of time, really stood the test of time for me, the, To Your Scattered Bodies Go. But so has the Doomsday Book. Is it better than Way Station? I really enjoyed Way Station. Loved that pastoral setting. Loved, you know, the first contact and having the opportunity to meet all those alien beings. Unforgettable novel for me. I read it so many years ago and it's always fresh in my mind. Just a wonderful novel. And I think I've just made up my mind. I'm going to say the Doomsday Book sits just below Waystation. And I'm going to really make that decision. Look, I'm going, to make, I'm going to make that decision really based on the fact that Waystation for me has been one of those go-to novels that I can always recommend. And every single person I've ever recommended Waystation to, after talking about what they liked and what they didn't like, what, what are they looking for in the novel, in the story, it's never failed me when it comes to a recommendation, right? And I found the pacing really nice throughout the whole book. It's only a short read. I love the concept. I love the characters. I love the setting. An unforgettable novel. I can say many of the same things for the Doomsday Book. The one thing that I can't say for it is that, yes, there is that section in the novel, in the middle there, where the plot doesn't quite progress as well as I think it probably could to keep most readers entertained and I think I'm cheating <laughs> if I say I enjoyed it more than I did Way Station but geez it's a great novel and honestly in some there are some things in this novel that I really did enjoy more than June that I did really enjoy more than Frederick Pohl's Gateway which is just another fantastic book but yeah, I think I'm going to stick Doomsday Book, the fourth on the list. It's definitely top 100 of my all-time novels. It'll probably end up being in my top 10 all-time novels. But time will tell. This is where we are tonight. Hey, where would you rank it? Have you read the Doomsday Book? Have you read some of the other books, like To Say Nothing of the Dog and All Out? What's it called? Blackout, All Clear? It's up the top there. You may just be able to see it. But I will be reviewing those novels uh, on the Hugo and Nebula award-winning ladder that we've got going on here. So it'll be interesting to see how those rank up in uh, comparison to the first book of the rank. But yeah, I've been Peter. This has been the Sci-Fi Shed. I think I'm pretty happy with that, where that's landed. Really wonderful novel. I hope you give it a read. Where would you rank it? Do you have a, do you have a thought? I'm looking forward to hearing from you and I'll see you next time in the shed.